Hi, everyone. Uh, so, okay, this is a talk about the history of WebAssembly. My name is Alon, and I work on the WebAssembly tools team at Chrome. So this is talk about the history of WebAssembly. You might have heard a little bit about it, but I'll give a brief overview about what it is, uh, just in case you haven't. Uh, you, you will, in a later talk, hear a lot more about the technical details, though. So WebAssembly, or WASM, is the second general purpose language for the web. So the web has had JavaScript for a long time, and we've added WebAssembly alongside it. And that's kind of a big deal because there's just two of them, and we didn't sort, sort of lightly add a second one. And WebAssembly is interesting because it's pretty different from JavaScript. It's a binary format, so it's more compact, downloads more quickly. It's a compilation target, so it's something that you typically don't write by hand like JavaScript. Rather, you write some other language and then compile down to WebAssembly, which is very low level. And WebAssembly is designed for speed uh, in, a, in a very specific way. Okay, so this talk is, how did the web come to standardize something like that? So we need to go quite a way back in history. So going back to 2008, over a decade, JavaScript suddenly became fast. So JavaScript was over a decade old at that time, but it was basically just interpreted in browsers. But by the end of 2008, there were three browsers that had just in time or JIT com com compilers. Uh, and these were a lot faster than anything before. So Chrome launched that year and with it, the V8 JavaScript engine. And also Firefox and Safari launched JITs in their own engines. So suddenly JavaScript became a lot faster. And this was just the beginning. For many years after 2008, these compilers got better and better. And we just saw constant, often very large speed ups in JavaScript. So it was, it was a very exciting time. But also it was reasonable to be a little skeptical about how fast will it be? How, how far can we take it? JavaScript is a dynamically typed language that wasn't designed to run as fast as a compiled language can be. And we do want to run things on the web that require pretty heavy co computation. So will, so JavaScript is getting faster all the time, but will it be fast enough for everything that we want? And I think it, this wasn't entirely clear at the time. And there were some thoughts that maybe we need to add something else aside from JavaScript. And there were a few ideas in this space. One non-JavaScript option that we'll talk about a bunch because it's important in the history is the native client project. So native client or NACL is basically a safe and fast subset of machine code. So it's very fast because it is just machine code at the end, but it's safe. We'll talk more about those things. So this started in 2008. It was created at Google by Brad Chen, Bennett Yee, and David Sayer. And in that year it was announced publicly and open sourced. And it showed a lot of promise. So there was a research paper in 2009, and it looked good enough that there was work towards turning this into an actual product and not just a research ex experiment. And the reason, well, one of the main reasons this showed so much promise is speed. So there's a lot of numbers on this slide, but the crucial thing is the rightmost column, which shows the overhead of native client compared to sort of a regular build. And that overhead is very, very low. It's just uh, basically single digits in most of the benchmarks. So it's running almost at the full speed that the code would run when compiled normally. That's very impressive and very good since the code is also safe to run in a browser. Let's talk a bit more about that safety. So native client was designed to have two layers of sandboxing. So if we have here on the left, the renderer, the, the, the render is sort of the, 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 the thing that renders the web page, it handles the DOM, the JavaScript, web APIs. So all that happens in its own process. The native client code wasn't even in that process. It was in a sandbox process on the side. And this is one layer of safety that you use the operating system mechanisms to, to guarantee that it can escape that process sandbox. Inside that sandbox process, 
the NACL code was also sandboxed itself. So it was a safe subset of code that could be verified. You would actually look at the code and the browser would tell that it's safe to run because it's sort of the subset that proves that it can't jump to arbitrary places, can't do unsafe instructions, et cetera. So it shouldn't even be able to escape this inner sandbox. But even if it does somehow, then it, all it can affect is the NACL runtime, which is alongside it, but not actually to affect the rest of the browser. Because all it can do is go through a plugin API to call out to it it's in its own process. So the design of running in a separate process was excellent for safety, as I said, but it also had other impacts on the design. In particular, you can't call web APIs. So again, this is the same thing we saw before. The NACL process is here. The render is here. The web APIs are all over here. So you don't have direct access to them. You have only sort of indirect access. The APIs that NACL can access directly are a plugin API. And this was initially NP API, the Netscape plugin API. And this is how Flash ran in, in browsers back in the day. And later, the much more secure and, as, and also asynchronous Pepper API or PP API, Pepper plugin API was created. And of course, this kind of Pepper is kind of a joke about NACL native client, which is also salt. So this is my best attempt to get a salt and pepper shaker, but there's no emoji for a pepper shaker, it turns out. Okay, so this running in a separate process was great for safety, but it did lead to some criticism in that you need to create a new plugin API for it to actually be able to do things. It can't just use existing web APIs. And browser vendors have worked together for many years to standardize those APIs. So adding sort of a new surface area that also overlaps. There's a web API to get a mouse click. So there's also a pepper API to get a mouse click. This overlap uh, did, didn't seem good to, to at least some people in the web space. Furthermore, pepper came along when the web was trying to move away from plugins. So for many years, Flash and Java and other plugins played an important role on the web. They let you do things that web standards couldn't yet do. And this was pretty significant, but they also had some downsides. And as the web became more powerful, there was a movement to try to just use web standards and avoid uh, plugins as much as possible. Now, early versions of NACL ran in multiple browsers using NP API, as I said, and NP API is how Flash ran. So most browsers had that. And so NACL could just work in the same way. But in 2011, Mozilla and Opera, two browser vendors, officially opposed both Pepper and NACL. And part of this was they didn't want to support another plugin API, the Pepper API. But also, they really didn't even want to support the old plugin API, NP API. So kind of native client depending on a plugin API was sort of the downside to adoption. And after Mozilla and Opera did that, uh, there was also no traction in other browsers, and NACL only ran in Chrome from that point. So this is a bit more complicated uh, because I, I've talked a bit loosely about sort of what is a plugin. So NACL definitely began as a plugin. It was something you would sort of add to the browser. But it was later integrated into Chrome as part of Chrome, part of the, the web platform in, in, in Chrome. So it was not a plugin in any technical sense at that point. But still, at least to some people in the web space, it felt more like a plugin because it was running in a separate process. It was using its own new set of APIs, as I said. It felt like this thing that's a bit separate from the rest of the web page, kind of like Flash and Java did. They ran in their own box, and they didn't sort of directly integrate the way people uh, wanted. Another issue with native client was portability. So a native client binary is machine code, as I said. So it's x86 machine code or R machine code. But of course, portability is very crucial for the web. It, you, you need to be able to visit a website no matter what browser you're on, what CPU you're on, what operating system you're on. So it's not good if a NACL binary is just x86 if you're on an ARM phone. So this is an obvious issue, of course. And in 2010, Portable Native Client, or Pinnacle, was announced. And Pinnacle basically replaces the machine code of NACL. 
with a subset of LLVM IR. LLVM IR is a compiler's intermediate representation. And you can kind of think of it as you sort of do half of the compilation to LLVM IR, you ship that to the client, to the browser, and then you sort of do the other half of the compilation and it's compiled on the client to native client. So it gets all the speed and safety guarantees of native client, but it's also something portable. So you create a single portable a native client, a single pinnacle build, and that'll run everywhere. So that solves the portability issue. There is the downside that uh, you do need to compile on the client, which takes more work, but this was also something obvious and the native client team w worked on it and they created this sub zero project, which is kind of a joke about compiling faster than dash O zero, which is typically pretty fast to compile. And this really was very fast. It compiled basically as fast as, as the code downloads. So essentially this, uh, this fixed the, the, the startup issue. Okay, so native client got a lot of industry interest. It worked really well in, for, there's a few examples on this slide. So in 2010, Unity, a very important game engine ported to NACL. 2011, Mono did, which is a very important uh, VM for the .NET family of languages. And later in that year, Bastion and a bunch of other prominent games ported to NACL. And all of this showed that it works. You can port real world content and it runs fast and it's safe. And so in 2013, in Chrome 31, Chrome shipped Pinnacle on the web. What that means is it was turned on by default. You didn't need to get your users to flip a flag. It would just work if you were running a Chrome. And remember at this time, other browser vendors were not on board, but the idea was we'll enable this, we'll give web developers a chance to use it, to build things with it, and hopefully they'll build really cool things, and that'll be a way to get other browser vendors to, to be interested in, in, in the NACL project. Okay, so I talked for a while about native client, but there's another set of technologies in this space as, as well that made an impact, so we'll talk a bunch about them now. And those are the SMGS and mscripting projects. So I actually play a role in this part of the, the history, so I'll talk a bit about what I did here. So in 2010, I, I was working on some startup for a while and it failed, so I, I, I found a new job in the US at Mozilla to work on Firefox. So I was very happy to work on something on the web and that's open source. So I started that job, but I kept tinkering in, the spare, in my spare time with the game engine from my startup, which, which I wanted to run on the web because I thought it would be cool to run it on the web. But the question was, how? So this is 2010, NACL was fairly new. It kind of showed that it can work, but it wasn't yet portable. Pinnacle had just been announced. And it wasn't clear whether other browser vendors than Chrome would adopt it. So there wasn't a good sort of obvious solution for running C++ on the web. And in this case, the relevant language is C++ because my game engine, like most game engines back then and, and, and even now, most are written in that language. So it wasn't obvious how to run compiled code on the web at the, at the time. So I was thinking, well, JavaScript is fast now. Remember, this is 2010, so these are the years JavaScript keeps getting faster. So I thought to myself, well, maybe let's compile to JavaScript. Now, the obvious issue is that JavaScript has no explicit types. It's dynamically typed, and that makes it hard to optimize. But my reasoning was when you compile C++ to JavaScript, it started out with types, so they would still be preserved implicitly, right? I mean, somehow. So if we have some the C++ here on the left, index equals 10, you could imagine you just translate that to JavaScript var x equals 10, it's a valid JavaScript, and it's, but it still preserves the type, right? The 10 is still an integer. When we do X plus plus, it increments the integer. So the JavaScript engine could make it fast, at least in theory. So I did an experiment with the PyPy compiler toolchain. PyPy is a very cool project that, that can do a lot of 
really, really nice things. One thing that it can do is take a language called R Python, a subset of Python, a language that like JavaScript doesn't write out the types. And it can do an analysis of the whole program and find all the types. This takes a little time, but once it's done, it can generate machine code for that entire thing. And it's fast. So I actually tried this out. I compiled to, to JavaScript, which didn't have types, compiled that to R Python, compiled that with PyPy, and I ran it. And it was pretty fast. It was almost as fast as running the original C++ code. So I bet that JavaScript would be fast enough, maybe if not now, but it was constantly getting faster. It would be fast eventually. And I started a compiler to JavaScript. And I called the compiler mscripten because it sort of scripts things. It turns, in this case, LVMIR into JavaScript. And it, there's also a Simpsons reference in there. They have an episode with a bunch of made up words. Uh, so if you're curious, you can look that up later. But anyway, this was a project for fun that I that I did kind of on the evening or on the weekend if I had some time. And by 2011, a year later, it did better than I think a lot of people expected, better than I expected. It could actually compile quite a lot of things, the real world code, like the Python VM, the Doom game. These things were never intended to run in a browser. They were written in a language that doesn't run there. But this compiler could actually run them there. I gave a talk at JSConf.eu about, about it, and I published a paper also about the interesting sort of algorithms that, that, that we need. In particular, it's kind of the opposite of a normal compiler in that we start from something low level, LVMIR, and go up to something high level, JavaScript. So, MScript needs to kind of find a way to represent the low level things at a high level. And that is a bit challenging for speed. So late in 2011, some people in Mozilla leadership gave me the option to join the research team at Mozilla to work on MScript in full time. And I was very, very happy to get that opportunity. So I, of course, said, said yes. And from then, this was basically my, my day job. So I got paid to work on it. And that was great. I, and I think it's worth asking why did they do this? So I mean, for me, obviously, it was it was it was great. But why did they think it made sense? It, so I think they understood that there was a need for something in this space. And they saw things like NACL, but they felt that native client for the reasons that I mentioned earlier, had some downsides like running in a separate process, new APIs. Whereas compiling to JavaScript felt at least not as web friendly as JavaScript itself, but as web friendly as you can get, it will still call web APIs in the end. It's compiled code. It might look weird, but it's still JavaScript. It doesn't run in a separate process. And it's not super fast right now, but remember, these are the years when JavaScript keeps getting faster. So the belief was, well, we'll compile to JavaScript and we'll let JavaScript engines get faster and it'll be great. We'll have all the speed that we need. So we were very optimistic at the time. We were, it turns out, overly optimistic. <laughs> JavaScript did keep getting faster, but it was not quite enough. So some of the initial skepticism back in 2008 or so was valid. So a main issue is that JavaScript compiles, as I mentioned earlier, just in time, it just JIT optimizations. It figures out the types as it goes. And this is unpredictable and takes effort and time. And it really was a limit. So in 2013, Luke Wagner, David Herman, and I came up with ASM.js, which is one way to solve this. So this is a little sample of ASM.js code. It's JavaScript. So this is 100% valid JavaScript. It's a subset of JavaScript. And it adds sort of this strict type system of coercions that you need to apply. So in this case, the function add just adds x and y. But it also has all these or zeros. The or zeros both prove and enforce the type. So how does that work? The or operator in JavaScript forces its inputs to be 32-bit integers. So we ensure that the type is correct. And by doing an or with zero, we don't change any bits. So we just change the type. 
So when the JavaScript engine sees this x plus y or zero, and note, by the way, that the or zero happens after the add. It's a little odd, but that's the order of operations. So when the JavaScript engine sees this x plus y, it actually knows that they're both integers and that the output is an integer. So it can just emit a 32-bit integer, the machine code for a 32-bit integer add. And that lets it be fast. And as I said, SMJS had a type system, so you could actually write use asm in your code, and that would just be a hint that has no semantic change. But if the JavaScript engine wanted to, it could use the SMJS type system to sort of type check the code. And if it validates, if it's valid SMJS, it would have discovered all the types in the process of doing that. And given all the types, it can do ahead of time or AOT compilation. And that's much more fast and much more predictable. Okay, so this is a graph from the initial version of SMGS optimizations in Firefox. So this shows three benchmarks, a skinning, which does some vertex skinning in a game engine, the Zlib compression library, and the bullet physics library. In each of the benchmarks, there are three bars. So the topmost one in blue is Firefox without SMGS optimizations. And you can see that in two of these benchmarks, it's about 12 times slower than sort of full speed. In one of them, it's about five times slower. So these are the speeds that we were seeing. But with SMJS, the green bar in the middle for each of these, we get a lot closer to sort of one, the full speed that we can achieve. We're about two times slower. So it's a lot better with these SMJS optimizations. And we did a lot more benchmarking and basically reach about 50% of full speed. And it did get better later. This was just the first version of it. But to be fair, it never quite reached the speed of native client. Uh, so it did, I think, pretty well, but certainly had some limitations. The limitations were largely because it was a hack. So I think it's kind of a fun hack. It's an interesting one that we found a way to use JavaScript to do ahead of time fast compilation, but it's still a hack. In particular, those or zeros are weird. They look weird. They're certainly not how JavaScript was intended to be used. People wrote blog posts about this and made valid points that it certainly is, is a weird thing and, and, and they were right. So JavaScript turned out to be pretty good as a compiler target, surprisingly good, really. We did end up adding a few things to the JavaScript spec, like for example, math.fround converts a double to a float. And these made sense for JavaScript anyway, and that was great. But there are things that a compiler target needs that wouldn't really make sense to add to JavaScript. So further additions would be an issue. There, there's just some things that don't make sense to use JavaScript as a compiler target. So we started out with the easy things, but And SMJS had a type system, as I said, and it got more complicated as we added new things. For example, we added memory growth, the ability for the amount of memory uses to grow and shrink over time. And it was complicated and annoying, and we ended up actually taking it out uh, just because of the, the complexity it added and there were bugs. So building on this, it was kind of hard. And so it's a fun hack to use JavaScript, but it is still JavaScript. And it, so it's a text form. It needs to be parsed as text. And that just can't compete with parsing an efficient binary format. So parse times, which means how fast you start up, was slow. So overall, SMG just worked, but it certainly had a bunch of downsides stemming from the fact that it was a hack. Despite the downsides, it did work pretty well and it worked in all browsers. So it, it attracted a bunch of industry interest. In 2013, Unreal Engine ported. Uh, Unreal Engine is a very important engine, a very important game engine. In 2014, U Unity, the, that other very important game engine that I mentioned earlier that ported to NACL, ported to SMGS and MScript and had a post about that this is what they're going to focus on for Unity on the web. And in 2015, two other browsers in Firefox, Edge and Chrome, announced that they were going to do SMJS-style 
optimizations, uh, so sort of showing that this approach that Firefox started it was useful for them too. Okay, so we've talked for about two thirds of the time about native client and Script and SMJS separately. But of course, these things sort of overlapped in time and they competed in a sense. Uh, so they competed because they were each sort of different visions for fast compiled code on the web. They both tried to solve the same problem, how to get these code bases to run on the web and run quickly. But they had different, very different approaches for how to do it. So the competition is pretty obvious here. What I want to focus on is what's less obvious, the cooperation that was, uh, that was also increasingly going on. So in 2013, for, for example, a bunch of us on the tool side from Google and Mozilla started to get lunch and dinner meetups just to talk about stuff. This was started by Jeff Bastian, who was at Google at the time. This was a really great idea. We started to share code more and more between the two projects. And there were things like Pepper.js that, that the NACL people made that could let you compile a NACL project to SMJS using mscripten. So you could have a single code base and you could either compile it to Pinnacle or to SMJS, which opened a bunch of interesting opportunities. And there was increasing cooperation on the browser side too, not just on tools. So the people working on SMGS optimizations in browsers like Luke Wagner from, uh, from the Firefox side and Ben Titzer from, from, from the Chrome side started to talk about, hey, how are we doing these optimizations? What, what works best? And as they were talking, it, they talked more and more about, well, SMGS is kind of a hack. Maybe we should think about a more proper bytecode, more better design solution for this. In 2015, a bunch of us from Google and uh, Mozilla and others mentoring the Game uh, Developers Conference, GDC, that year to discuss what was at the time called WebASM. And the plans got increasingly concrete to actually create something new in this space to actually standardize a new language for the web. So of course, this is all leading to WebAssembly. And we found the first email, which appears to mention the name WebAssembly from an email between Google and Mozilla on April 1st, 2015. So it wasn't a joke, it was a serious name. And it replaced a bunch of earlier uh, names. So there was a bunch of activity behind the scenes around this time to sort of uh, plan for how to start the standardization process for something like this. All the browser vendors were we're talking, we sort of pre 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 prepared some repos and a website and so forth. And in June of 2015, we announced it publicly. That is that all browser vendors are coming together to standardize a new language for the web. So this is a pretty big deal. You don't just every day announce that you're standardizing a new language or a new feature of, of this uh, uh, scope. So that was when we announced it. And then we started the design process. So there's a lot to design in a new language, uh, and that took a while. After two years of very hard work, in 2017, we reached a consensus on the WebAssembly minimal viable product, that is WebAssembly 1.0. And before the end of that year, by November, all four major browsers shipped support for it. So we added basically this new language, WebAssembly, to the web in 2017 after deciding to work on it in 2015. So I think it's interesting to talk about what changed historically in 2015. What I mean is for many years, people have asked, well, why don't browsers just ship a VM or ship a bytecode and let us use whatever language we want? If you look, for example, on Hacker News in the years 2010, 2011, et cetera, on any post about using languages on the web, using JavaScript on the web, uh, the status of Flash, stuff like, like that, you'll get, you'll see comments that say this, why don't they just ship a VM and let us use any language? So of course it's not easy to just ship a VM. It takes a lot of time to standardize it with all the vendors uh, just to get them to agree on which one. 
takes a lot of engineering to integrate it. So it's not easy, but it is a reasonable question. If JavaScript isn't good enough for everything, and JavaScript is great for many, many things, but maybe not everything. So if we need something else, why don't we do this? So people were asking for this for many years before 2015. Why did browsers finally end up doing this? And why specifically at that time? So I think there's a bunch of factors. One is that both native client and SMGS showed a lot of industry interest. As I said, there were a bunch of things. I, I gave a bunch of game mentioned examples mainly, but there were a lot of other things too. There was a definite need for this by people shipping code on the web. And this was especially obvious because plugins, remember, were going away. The, the web was trying to focus on web standards. And plugins were how people used to run games and a lot of this sort of content that needs more compute power. So Nacl and SGS showed that there was a need for this. And even more specifically, browsers had to optimize SMJS since it's JavaScript, it runs anyway in their browser and they're competing on JavaScript. So they need to optimize SMJS well. But once you start to do that, it's pretty obvious that SMJS is a hack. It has a bunch of downsides stemming from it being a hack, like I mentioned. So it's natural for the people working on this to want something better and cleaner. So SMJS kind of nudges people towards, well, let's standardize a proper solution for this space. And also very important, I think, is the increasing collaboration, as I mentioned, between competing browsers and competing tool chains. So these browsers were in, in, in competition, obviously, but increasingly over those years, the people in this space, they talked more, they collaborated more. As I said, they, they shared code, they shared ideas. And this made it a lot more possible to think about let's work together to standardize a completely new thing instead of a competition that's, uh, that's working on separate things. And I think that history of how we came to standardize WebAssembly shows itself in what WebAssembly is. So though there'll be a talk late, later about all the technical de details, but, but just briefly, it has some of the best parts of both native client and SMJS. So like native client, it's not based on JavaScript. Uh, this was something native client got very much right. You do need a new proper design. You do need a binary format. JavaScript, as I said, is wonderful for many, many things, but there are some things that you do need to start from, from a scratch with a new approach. And that's what WebAssembly does like NACL. And like SMJS, it runs in the same process as the DOM is, and it can call web APIs through JavaScript very directly. So there's no, it's not in a process on the side. It doesn't have a new set of APIs. So it fits into the web as well as compiled code can. And this is something I think SMJS got right and WebAssembly basically does it, the, the same in that area. So NACL and SMGS have since been deprecated and basically all the efforts of, uh, of browser vendors in this space have focused on WebAssembly on, on the single standard that we've all agreed to do. And that's been the case since basically 2015. A few notes on the tool. So obviously the efforts in the tool space converged as well. Uh, so WebAssembly, as I just said, uses web APIs. It, calls out the JavaScript and you can use anything from, from there. So in MScript, and we worked for many years to add support for various web APIs, things like pthreads, OpenGL, SDL2. These are APIs that people need in a lot of code bases and getting them to run on the web is actually pretty hard because the web is very different than most targets. So all that effort to make web APIs usable for compiled code still makes sense in WebAssembly, just like for SMJS. So engineers from uh, Mozilla and uh, Google worked uh, together to collaborate on adding WASM support to the MScript and compiler. They also worked to create a new LVM WebAssembly backend, sort of a new proper way to compile WebAssembly. And that's now used in MS, M, uh, uh, script and also used by itself standalone. There's a lot more to say about things in the tool space, but I just wanted to give these two examples 
of, of things that kind of showed that the efforts that once we agreed on a web standard on, on WebAssembly, we also focused to work together on the toolchain side as much as possible. Okay, and this is basically my last slide. So this has been a history talk, and I talk mostly about sort of history in the farther past. But just to talk a little bit about sort of recent history, very exciting things are happening all the time in WebAssembly. In many senses, it is, as the slide says, just getting started. So just last year, WebAssembly off the web has seen increasing interest with, for example, the beginning of WASI, the WebAssembly system interface, which makes it more practical to run WASM on the server. So this is very interesting. In 2015, when we started to work on WebAssembly, we thought that it might be useful off the web too. And we, we tried to keep it open as a possibility and not to sort of bake web details into it. Uh, but we didn't know if it would be. So it's actually very cool to see that this is happening, that there is a lot of interest in the server space for WASM. And of course, WebAssembly on the web is seeing a lot of adoption as well. A lot of sites use it without you even knowing. They just use it to speed up some computation. But there are a lot of more obvious things. For example, Google Earth now has a port to WebAssembly and WebGL. So you can just browse the Earth in 3D from any browser today. It's really cool. A few examples just from this here. New languages are constantly being ported to WebAssembly. For example, the Blazor project is now officially uh, production ready. Uh, Blazor is a project from Microsoft that lets you run the .NET family of languages in the browser. So that's really nice. And we're not done with WebAssembly on the, on the spec side. We're still creating new features and adding them. So as I said, we shipped the MVP in 2017 but there are a lot of more features that we need and are working on. For example, SIMD helps speed up a, certain types of code that really need, needs it, things like a codex and other things. And the Google Meet team actually had a, had a post very recently showing how they use WebAssembly and WebAssembly SIMD uh, to speed up things like filters and video calls, all on the client, really cool stuff. That's it. That's all I had for slides. Happy to take questions if there are any. Thank you. Looks like there might not be any questions. Okay, so if there's no questions then, then I think we're all done. Thank you for listening. That's it for me. Bye.